Adapting to Climate Change Action Integrating Archaeology and the Historic Environment within Nature-Based Solutions and Adaptation Strategies at a Range of Scales As Scotland's largest land manager, Forestry and Land Scotland is well placed to capture carbon through nature-based solutions such as tree planting and peatland restoration. Our ambition is to put protecting biodiversity and developing nature-based solutions at the heart of our forward-thinking, innovative approach and to reduce our emissions, capture more carbon and adapt how we manage the land. Forestry and Land Scotland's Climate Change Plan details how we will take action on climate change and biodiversity loss through reducing emissions, capturing carbon and adapting to change. It makes for impressive reading and importantly places the biodiversity crisis alongside the climate emergency. But how can archaeology and the historic environment best be integrated? And can it also help make a difference? Is heritage really part of the solution? This paper is not about protection, regulation and the UK forestry standard, or the relevant development control processes at play. And it is not about creating a heritage-led climate action plan for Scotland's national forests and land. Instead, this paper will consider the integration of archaeology and the historic environment within an existing climate change plan as part of our nature-based solutions and at a range of scales, ensuring that developing adaptation strategies include opportunities for cultural resource management to contribute positively, particularly in regards to the biodiversity crisis. I want to unpack that last paragraph a little because it sets out the structure of this paper. Firstly, what's with the archaeology and? Most heritage-led climate change plans focus firmly on the protection and conservation of the tangible historic environment and on the intangible contribution of placemaking, storytelling and communication, all undeniable skills of the archaeological profession but tend not to mention the proactive act of archaeological work to provide a record and enhance our understanding. My role as FLS archaeologist sees me advise on the protection of the historic environment on Scotland's national forests and land during forestry operations such as harvesting and restocking, for example. I also support conservation work, drawing up plans and specifications for the conservation management of significant historic assets. This cultural resource management also includes proactive archaeological work such as measured survey that can feed through into presentation and interpretation. Cultural resource management considers historic assets as just that, as assets to be valued, nurtured and used. Significant historic assets contribute to a local sense of place and, when investigated, to a wider appreciation and understanding of our shared past. Forestry and Land Scotland's Climate Change Plan details how we will take action on climate change and biodiversity loss using nature-based solutions, adapting our sustainable forest and land management to best effect and taking actions to protect, sustainably manage and restore natural and modified ecosystems. Nature-based solutions include woodland creation, peatland restoration and renewable energy generation. These developing adaptation strategies help us provide a huge range of ecosystem services for Scotland, such as flood prevention, slope stabilisation and soil improvement. These projects are also helping to create jobs, often in rural areas, in the expanding green economy. Cultural heritage management is usually concerned with place, with buildings and monuments, buried archaeological deposits, sites and setting. However, nature-based solutions are usually undertaken at a landscape scale, and it is usually at this scale that we must consider how best to ensure that they include archaeology and the historic environment. You may be sensing a caveat. Many of our landscape scale nature-based solutions and adaptation strategies have co-benefits, knock-on effects and off-site impacts. Peatland restoration delivers on carbon capture, improves water quality, slows the flow and helps to prevent flooding and provides an enhanced habitat for wildlife and biodiversity. Numerous outputs from a single action. 
Rewilding projects using cattle to grave and beavers to bioengineer create multiple small-scale interlinked habitat networks. So scale is not just about place or landscape, it's about reach and impact and about anticipating the consequences of any intervention. We are creating new woodland to help absorb more carbon, more than 4,000 hectares over the last five years. We're aiming to do it in ways that minimise ground disturbance and prevent the loss of carbon from the soil. By choosing the right species, we can give the trees the best chance in a changing climate and we can improve habitats as we do so. As we will see, there are opportunities to record relic historic landscapes and set significant historic assets within biodiverse habitat networks. We are also restoring our peat box to help conserve biodiversity. And as we rewet these sites, we're turning them from net sources of greenhouse gases into sites that will eventually store carbon. Since 2015, we have restored 6,500 hectares, and by 2025, we expect to be restoring 3,000 hectares annually. This is a huge programme of work, but in reality is not one that is likely to significantly impact upon the historic environment. For Scotland, climate change is predicted to result in warmer and wetter winters, bringing an increased risk of flooding, drier and hotter summers, bringing drought and wildfire, more frequent storms and more risk of pests and diseases. Increasing the resilience of Scotland's national forests and land is a top priority. We are investing in key adaptation actions to build the resilience of our forests and land, future-proofing them to cope with more frequent wildfires, droughts, floods and new or damaging pests and diseases. These adaptation measures include increased use of thinning and continuous cover forestry, increased forest species diversification and much more deer management to allow natural regeneration. We will also respond to and prepare for the impacts of pests and diseases such as Phytophthora remorum on larch, red band needle blight on pine and Calara on ash. Just dealing with the larch issue alone is another huge programme of work. With more frequent storms coming from more varied directions, there is an increased risk of wind blow and storm damage, and uprooted trees can cause a lot of damage both above and below ground. A move towards more continuous cover forestry, which uses thinning as opposed to clear fell, and natural regeneration as opposed to restocking, will make our forests more resilient. With a greater mix of tree species and ages, our forests will also make a greater contribution towards the biodiversity crisis, particularly in terms of deadwood ecology. For the historic environment, more resilient forests and woodland habitats will bring benefits in terms of lower risk of wind blow and less intervention in so soil profiles by harvesting machines and restocking programmes. Relatively open woodland will remain a conducive setting for significant historic assets, although with care taken to ensure that there are no trees growing on upstanding remains. However, it will be important to evidence and record this decision in land management plans, ensuring that the care and conservation of the significant historic asset is recorded as a clear objective. We also aim to increase the overall biodiversity value of our national forests and land. This will include work to protect, maintain and enhance designated sites and other areas of high conservation value, working with partners to deliver conservation action at a landscape scale and targeted conservation work for priority species and habitats. We are also restoring our native woodlands and controlling non-native invasive rhododendron. This will contribute to our work to restore populations of rare and endangered species such as capercaillie, white-tailed eagles, wildcat and water vole. Native woodland restoration will be another huge programme of work with real opportunities for archaeology and the historic environment to contribute in terms of informing and celebrating the work and by providing niche habitats for biodiversity. So this paper is not about regulation and development control processes or about creating a heritage-led climate change plan for Scotland's national forests and land.
It's about thinking creatively to see significant historic assets included within nature-based solutions at a range of scales, and ideally helping to make a difference. To do this effectively, we need to understand the nature and extent of the historic assets in our stewardship, look to where we can best share objectives and create co-benefits, and consider where we should look to prepare for and enable nature-based solutions. We need to learn from the ecosystem approach to biodiversity and better appreciate interconnected diversity within the historic environment. By taking an asset management approach to the historic environment, we can inform and direct our resource investment, assessing cultural significance and options for sustainable conservation management. Our asset management approach provides a framework for discussion and helps to ensure that complex issues are recognised and considered such as evaluating the nature and security of potential buried remains and identifying opportunities for archaeological measured survey, sustainable conservation management, structural consolidation or restoration and reuse of both upstanding remains and historic structures. The asset management approach sets place-based priorities within the wider strategic scale of land management. Individual assets are considered within their wider context not just to assess their place within that wider context, but to place value on and appreciate the wider context as a collective whole. This assessment of cultural significance steps beyond the individual asset to place greater emphasis on its place within the interconnected diversity of the collective whole. Taking our lead from the ecosystem approach, the collective whole could have a range of different definitions. A regional site type, a relict historic landscape or a multi-period landscape. None of this is new, but the shift in thinking from individual asset management to collective archaeodiversity in form and condition puts us in a strong position to engage with wider programmes of work. Promoting the role of the asset management approach within these wider programmes of work can raise the profile of significant historic assets and integrate natural and cultural conservation management requirements. At a landscape scale, restoring ancient and native woodlands can and should involve woodland archaeology, from historic landscapes of charcoal burning platforms to veteran trees and evidence of historic woodland management and archaeology can play a big role in informing and celebrating the work. At a place-based scale, open spaces within forest and woodland created to avoid damaging archaeological sites can host pollinator-friendly habitats. Enhanced conservation management with both biodiversity and historic environment objectives. We have long been managing historic structures and accidentally benefiting bats, but how about aiming to do it on purpose and including actions where possible to, ven to benefit bugs and beasts, rare plants, mosses and lichens? Archaeodiversity would see significant historic assets managed in a range of ways for a range of different purposes. By understanding ecological spatial patterns and connectivity, we will be better placed to suggest linkages or enlargement that could in include significant historic assets. And these include the way that soils, climate and habitats change across the landscape and the way different species inhabit these places. Working to integrate the open spaces within our forests can set our significant historic assets within enhanced habitat networks, and working within multi-partner rewilding projects such as Cairngorms Connect in the Highlands can cross boundaries and link neighbours at a supra-landscape scale. Prospective walkover survey should be considered in advance of woodland creation, peatland restoration and renewable energy generation, and there are good mechanisms available within the development control context to ensure this happens. However, consideration should also be given to off-site consequences such as riparian archaeology at risk from increased flooding events downstream. A more comprehensive detailed survey should be employed, recording the historic landscapes in advance of necessary nature-based solutions. As an example, the comprehensive landscape survey of relic field systems on the Isle of Ulva enabled extensive native woodland creation to be designed across the whole area. Although the care and conservation of significant historic assets is obviously important, so is a programme of detailed recording to enhance our knowledge and understanding.
archaeological measured survey of significant historic assets should be considered a priority and a benefit, particularly given the possible localised damage and disturbance caused by the consequences of climate change. From ruination and rewilding through stabilisation and consolidation to restoration and even replication, accepting archaeodiversity will increase the resilience of the collective whole to the consequences of climate change. With targeted archaeological recording, assessment and understanding, appreciating the diversity and complexity within our stock of historic assets enables a much greater range of responses within necessary nature-based solutions. These include archaeological evaluation to assess and ensure the security of significant known buried remains, low intensity conservation management of upstanding remains within a pollinator friendly wildflower meadow, managing a hill fort within thinned native woodland, cutting most but not all of the regenerating trees, setting a historic landscape within an area of native woodland creation or as part of an enhanced habitat network allowing the gradual ruination of a historic structure within an area set aside for rewilding, even moving an internationally significant Neolithic village inland away from the threat of coastal erosion. Embracing archaeodiversity is the first step towards the positive integration of archaeology and the historic environment within an existing climate change plan.